Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as per the case may be in your place. I am Madan Rehani, President IUMP, and I will be moderating the session today. Happy International Medical Physics Week to all of you. As you know that we are having one webinar every day, and today's webinar is on radiation protection of patients. We will, uh, you can use the chat function for putting in the question, but please do not spam the chat area by writing something which is not pertinent. Like yesterday, we found some people writing about CME or something like that. IUMP does not award CME or does not award the certification. So if anybody wants, tends to spam the chat, we will block the participants. Uh, the question typically asked is about the recorded uh, portion of the webinar. We record all the webinars and they are made available on IUMP website with typically within 24 to 48 hours of the event. So uh, today's webinar also will be recorded and will be available on the IUMP website. So with that, I wish to welcome the uh, two distinguished speakers who are really very highly distinguished persons in their own area. Both of them started their career in radiation oncology. Ola Homburg is head of the radiation protection of patients unit at the IAEA. He is medical physicist by profession. Dr. Maria Perez is the head of the radiation protection unit at the WHO. She started her career as a radiation oncologist and both of them then moved on to radiation protection. Both of them are doing a great job at the international level and have contributed immensely and we are honored to have both of them speaking to us today. They will be talking in sequence. First, Dr. Ola Homburg's presentation will be the recorded presentation uh, we will play. This will be followed by the presentation of Dr. Maria Perez. She will speak live. And then we will have the questions which we will find in the chat box. So you are free to write the question in the chat box. We tend to finish the session in 60 minutes. So we will try to see that we maintain the time. If every question can be answered during that time, fine. Otherwise, we will have to skip some questions. With that, uh, I welcome all of you to this webinar. And I will start the presentation of Dr. Ola Homburg, which is a recorded presentation. Many thanks for this opportunity to take part in this International Medical Physics Week provided by the IOMP. My name is Ola Ombe and I have worked at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna for the last 13 years. I've been asked to say a few words about how the IAEA is contributing to patient radiation protection. So the IAEA is part of the extended United Nations family. It was set up as the world's Atoms for Peace organization in 1957 and is the world's center of cooperation in the nuclear field. You can see a picture here of our headquarters in Vienna. At last count, we have around 2,500 staff from more than 125 countries. The IAEA was also the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. Patient protection is something we work with in the Radiation Protection of Patients Unit, or RPOP, RPOP, in the Nuclear Safety Department. We also work closely with colleagues in the Human Health Division when it comes to all medical uses of radiation. In the next few slides, I will discuss our mandate 
to work with radiation protection of patients. What are the key documents for shaping the program? Number one are the IAEA statutes as approved by the United Nations. The statutes call for the IAEA to establish or adopt safety standards and to provide for the application of these standards. In other words, to support the implementation. The second key document for shaping the program in patient protection is the international BSAs or the basic safety standards. These safety standards are part of the IAEA safety standards and are co-sponsored by the World Health Organization, the Pan American Health Organization and others. The IAEA must follow these standards in its own operations and many member states adopt them into their own regulations. Number three is the Bonn Call for Action. This is a joint position statement by the IAEA and the WHO that was formulated at the International Conference on Radiation Protection in Medicine in Bonn, Germany in 2012. It contains 10 main actions and a lot of sub-actions to improve radiation protection in a decade. On this slide, we can see action four, which is to strengthen radiation protection education and training of health professionals. The final key document that I want to mention is the Nuclear and Radiation Safety Resolution. This is less well known outside of the organization. The final key document that I want to mention is the Nuclear and Radiation Safety Resolution. This is less well known outside of the organization, but it's essentially stating what the member states are requesting the IAEA to prioritize every year. In the 2020 safety resolution, we can see that the continued implementation of the Bonn Call for Action is seen as priority. So this provides a strong mandate to continue this work. So we have now seen that we have a mandate to work with radiation protection of patients. The next question is, what do we actually do? Well, in a nutshell, we help member states to minimize unnecessary and unintended exposures in medicine. And we do this by helping to strengthen justification of medical exposures and optimization of radiation protection and safety in medicine. We also help with prevention of accidents in medical uses of radiation. So we work with a risk but we try to always emphasize all the benefits from medical uses of radiation, which are huge, as we all know. Collaborating and cooperating brings many benefits, of course, and a lot of the work we do is done in cooperation with other international organizations and professional societies, such as uh, IOMP. Our main partner is the World Health Organization. This slide shows the different categories of activities that we This slide shows the different categories of activities that we have in the area of patient protection. And over the next few slides, I would like to present some more concrete examples under these separate headings. First out is the activity to provide safety standards. To support the international basic safety standards, which covers all uses of radiation, we have the specific safety guide on radiation protection in medical uses, or SSG 46 which was published in October of 2018. 
You can download it for free. And it's very popular to download. It's been in the top 10 IAEA books since it was published. It covers radiation protection of patients, workers, and the public in medical uses of radiation. In relation to training activities, we can split this up into in-person training activities and online-based activities, which we will look at in the next couple of slides. The in-person training is done as training courses or workshops, and also as individual training through the provision of We also have some new hybrid training material on radiation safety culture in healthcare, launched earlier this year. This course is intended for in-person training, but complemented by digital presentations from medical facilities around the world on how to improve safety culture in practice. In terms of online-based training activities, the RCOP e-learning was launched at the end of 2016 and has reached more than 12,000 participants until now. Some of these courses are in several languages and a certificate of completion is usually available once you have completed a training. One of our newest e-learning courses has a different format. Radiation protection in interventional procedures contains 13 short interactive videos intending to be practical visual tutorials to learn the effect of various factors on patient and staff dose. Another brand new e-learning package that is now available is on the topic radiation protection in dental radiology and it's intended for dentists and other dental professional staff. Under development is an e-learning package on the diagnostic reference levels concept and methodology and how to implement DRLs in practice. We also do RPOP webinars in different languages, usually in cooperation with other organizations such as the IOMP. Since 2016, there have been around 60 webinars reaching more than 10,000 participants from 100 member states. These webinars are also recorded and available from our website. The next category we will look at is guidance. This can be printed and published guidance as well as online guidance. New for this year is a safety report on radiation protection and safety in veterinary medicine. Next up is a technical document on quality control in diagnostic radiology, written in Spanish, and a safety report on radiation protection in dental radiology after that. Digital guidance is done through the RPOP website, and this is also where you find links to all the material that I mentioned in this talk. We get 1 million page views annually to this website and it's the third most successful topical hub in the whole IAEA, just after the IAEA job posting pages and the fact sheets on Fukushima. Some other free guidance material you can find on the RPOP website are the 10 pearls posters on good practice for health professionals. You can print these out and post them in the rooms used by staff. There's also posters to remind patients to tell staff before an X-ray or nuclear medicine procedure if they are pregnant or think they may be. 
this poster is available in 28 languages. If you would be interested in another language for your facility, just contact us in the RPOP unit. In addition, we also have short informative videos on radiation protection in medicine in different languages that the public has access to. These videos have received more than a million views. The next category we will look at is knowledge exchange. Some of you may have heard of the Saffron system, safety and radiation oncology, which is an incident learning system for radiotherapy. This is voluntary and anonymized and currently contains information on more than 1,300 incidents and near misses. It started out with external beam radiotherapy, but now also contains brachytherapy and therapeutic nuclear medicine events. We also provide the SAFRA system, safety and radiological procedures, for high dose events in image guided interventional procedures with currently more than 350 events having surpassed the defined trigger level. Finally and briefly, building awareness is done through information campaigns and also scientific publications and review papers. Technical assistance is provided directly to member states through provision of advice and tools, assessment missions, and a number of projects carried out in different countries and regions. If you want to keep up to date on new material from our pop and also other news, you can subscribe to our newsletter, which is issued around 10 times per year. You find it on the our pop website. Thank you. Thank you, Ola, for this very comprehensive talk and the information about huge resources that are available from the IAA and ARPOP website. We will have the questions after the both presentations are over and Dr. Ola Homburg is available to answer question live uh, with us today. And with that, I will now request uh, uh, Dr. Maria Perez to start her presentation. Maria, please. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Madam. Uh, let me know if you can see my presentation in full screen now. Yes. And I want to uh, start by uh, thanking um, the International Organization of Medical Physicists from this invitation to be part of the celebration of the International Medical Physics Week and to share also this uh, uh, session with uh, my colleague Ola and the other colleagues from my UNP. So I will refer on to the same topic, patient radiation protection and how WHO is contributing. And I will start uh, saying that uh, WHO is uh, the organization in the UN system acting as uh, the agency directing and coordinating the international health work with the objective of attaining by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. And this is being done in the context of the current 13th global program of work of WHO, which has established the triple billion target, uh, which is based on achieving 1 billion more people benefiting from universal health coverage, 
one billion more people benefiting from uh, enjoying better health and well-being, and one billion more people more better protected from emergencies. So we can see that all these three triple billion targets are very relevant nowadays. Uh, since 2020, all the world has been facing the huge challenge of the COVID pandemic. I don't need to talk too much about this. All of you know these are the latest uh, numbers as, as of yesterday of confirmed uh, cases, almost 150 million in the world, with more than 3 million reported deaths and uh, about 1 billion of vaccine doses. And uh, the work of WHO in uh, radiation protection of patients is done in this context today along these eight pillars of the WHO response to COVID. And as I have no time to go uh, into these eight pillars, but just to show that several of them are related to the use of radiation in diagnosis, in clinical management of COVID, uh, in the link that it has to infection prevention and control and maintaining essential health systems with all the cross-cutting activities as coordinating, planning, operational support and logistic and accelerating research and innovation. In this context, universal health coverage continues being a high priority for WHO and to uh, all its uh, 194 member states. And universal health coverage includes safety and quality of health services. And therefore, protecting patients, ensuring safe and appropriate use of radiation in medicine definitely contributes to achieving this goal of universal health coverage as radiation safety or patient safety in general is one of the components of the uh, concept of healthcare quality or the dimensions of healthcare quality, which include appropriateness, accuracy, affordability, accountability, safety, timeliness, patient centricity. So once more, protection of patients, radiation protection of patients is part of that. I just um, very quickly mentioned that uh, WHO has finalized the draft Global Patient Safety Action Plan for the 2021 to uh, 2030 for this period. And the final draft is available on the web. Many of you contributed uh, to review and commented on this draft. So I invite you to, to visit this website. Um, just to remind you or to mention, this Patient Safety Action Plan has as a vision and mission and, and goal, which is basically not zero harm, but zero preventable or avoidable harm in patients. So this is very relevant to the topic of this webinar. It refers to the partners in actions with governments, healthcare facilities, stakeholders, international organizations, and of course, WHO, with guiding principles and strategic objectives we will again not have time to go through them now, but I just want to, to present that this is the framework with the seven strategic objectives of this global action plan on patient safety. And one key objective is assure the safety of every clinical process. Therefore, patient safety in the context of medical use of radiation is one of these priorities. It was established in 2019 by the World Health Assembly, the celebration of the World Patient Safety Day every, uh, every year on the 17th of September to uh, raise awareness and, and uh, engage uh, countries to promote patient safety. This year, the Patient Safety Day will be focused on the theme of safe, maternal and newborn, newborn care uh, under the campaign slogan of act now for safe and respect of child birth. And this is very relevant because the burden of disease of risk of women and babies is, is huge, but now more than ever with the disruption on essential health services caused by COVID. So we hope on the 17th of September to have many, many iconic monuments, landmarks, public places, marking the World Patient Safety Day, lighting in orange, 
Uh, it is something that already happened in 2019 and 20, and we hope this will happen as to symbolize the central role of patient safety and in this context, of course, radiation protection of patients. So in this context, we are continuing in implementing the global initiative on radiation safety in healthcare settings on the different disciplines where radiation is used for healthcare to promote quality and safety, access to quality and safety in the medical use of radiation in these areas of assessing risks, uh, communicating risks and managing risks. As Ola already mentioned, uh, and we are collaborating very, very closely, cooperating closely with the IAEA to support the implementation of the 10 priority actions of the BON call for action. All of them contribute to enhancing patient safety. And we collaborate also with international organizations and stakeholders, and IOMP is one of them, of our key partners. In the context of COVID, and for improving radiation protection of, of patients and increasing access to quality and safety in the medical use of radiation, we focus our work on developing clinical guidance, a rapid advice guide on chest imaging in COVID uh, in June 2020, technical specifications for uh, imaging equipment, for lung ultrasound, CT, and uh, mobile uh, radiography. We develop as a derivative product a training package with modules on imaging guidelines, typical imaging findings, and also safety procedures, including radiation protection and, and infection prevention and control. And more recently, we conducted new systematic reviews. Uh, and the second edition of this guide has been already developed, is in the pipeline, hopefully to be published soon together with manuscripts and now uh, the focus of in the line with the WHO work is the post-COVID condition that may be a, a big challenge in the coming um, years. So these are some of the products that have been published related to this uh, imaging uh, guideline for COVID, uh, the derivative product, the manuscripts and the translations into uh, these seven languages. Uh, you know that education and training in, uh, is always essential in radiation protection. In COVID times, it's, it's really a, a challenge and we need uh, solutions to deliver uh, resources at the point of care. WHO had made an effort during the COVID pandemic to put um, an operative, the uh, so-called the open, the WHO Academy Learning App called Open WHO. And we have produced the models on chest imaging uh, for um, for that uh, app. Uh, I move now quickly because of the time to another area of work in relation with supporting the bone call for action, the action one on justification. And it is dealing with the uh, use of radiation in asymptomatic people. Uh, you know that computer tomography is being increasingly used worldwide in asymptomatic people for individual health assessment on coronary artery calcium scoring, coronary plaques, early detection of lung cancer, and even in whole body surveys. And uh, this is something that has been addressed in the, in the international BSS. Uh, Ola mentioned that we are collaborating with IAEA on this topic to support implementation of the BSS. So in response to this, WHO has developed a guidance on regulation and governance of the use of computer tomography for individual health assessment which uh, the primary audience are the health authorities and policy makers and, and regulators, addressing first radiation protection issues, but then we realized that there were many other issues as the, the ones that I am mentioning here that goes well beyond radiation safety. So we are collaborating with other partners. Uh, we identify this guy, the, the features characterizing the screening practices. And based on this, also, to, we propose a taxonomy of these screening practices going from those that are more acceptable in terms of the characteristics and the um, evidence base of the benefits uh, and the approval of health authorities, etc., towards those who are really in the, in the arbitrary, put here like a, a red color in the type five, who are uh, the screening on demand uh, really ethical, questionable, 
And then in the document, it is proposed a framework for good governance of these practices if a country uh, will accept some under certain conditions. Another area of work, I will move on so quickly because we had a special seminar here, a webinar with IOMP, with uh, IAA, with IRPA and WHO, is a radiation safety culture in healthcare, a joint project. We organized together six regional workshops in different regions of the world. We collected feedback of, from all these uh, ex stakeholders. And a joint guidance document was, pub it was um, produced, it's again also on the pipeline. And madams, you know that I, we were working even in the night on the final editing of this yesterday. Um, key messages, uh, we have no time, but some key messages is the actions to enhance protection and safety represent radiation safety. But this becomes radiation safety culture when this really is embedded in the organizational and individual attitudes, behaviors, etc. And when we say how we do things here when nobody is watching us. So do the right thing even when nobody is watching. And in this document, it is also encourage everybody, everyone have, uh, has a role in strengthening radiation in the facilities. And then uh, the, the document identified the roles of international players, uh, organizations and prof professional societies, national leaders, and especially the local healthcare institutions, and also the role of patients, families, and communities. And it adopted the 10 traits of the positive radiation safety culture that were really initially developed by the IAEA, but we adopted this in our joint document with proposing tools for establishing and maintaining, and also tools for assessing safety culture. Again, moving quickly, I want to announce that WHO has updated the guidance on tuberculosis screening, and this has a lot to do also with patient protection and safety, because radiation protection and safety. Because these guidelines now include recom new recommendations on chest radiography and also on the use of artificial intelligence, computer aided detection software. It was launched on the World Tuberculosis Day last month. And, and we need to have more education and training, a lot of this. Uh, we are now expanding also uh, technical specifications for portable and even ultra portable radiography units. So I put this in the link, you can go there, you can read the guidelines and also the operational handbook with, this was presented at the joint WHO ISR webinar last month with about 500 participants from 101 country. And the handbook, the operational handbook will present to you the different scenarios, different very nice um, flow charts like this one, and a, a chapter on implementation of uh, computer aided uh, detection technologies. Uh, before finalizing, I want to mention a project that we are conducting in Latin America and Caribbean countries, WHO PAHO, and also in close cooperation with the IAA and under the scientific guidance of, uh, it's, it's a privilege of, uh, of Professor Eliseo Bagno, who is also a medical physicist, and working with a lot of medical physicists in Latin America. Um, the, uh, Already nine countries are involved in this project, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Mexico, Peru, Uruguay. And the first set of regional diagnostic reference levels, preliminary, very preliminary, were obtained for diagnostic procedures and therapeutic procedures. The project was presented at two international events, ECR 2020 and IRPA this year. It, you can see here the website of the project is in Spanish. So far, we may translate it in the future. But these are the 18 hospitals from nine countries that are currently actively participating, providing data. This is uh, the annual frequency of interventional cardiology procedures in children that we collected so far. And you can see that this very, there are many differences between countries, but let's say the mean is 224 pediatric procedures per year. And these are the very preliminary results, uh, and you will see that they are in age bands, not yet in weight bands, as they should be, but we are working currently, uh, and we hope to have values for weight bands um, 
in the near future and also include the manual collection of data with automatic uh, co data collection on patient doses. And to finalize, uh, you probably know that we, we had been conducting for several years a project on radiation risk communication in pediatric imaging, producing a report <clears throat> On, um, on this topic in different languages uh, and also leaflets for patients and, and families members uh, supporting again one of the actions of the bone call for action. This year was the first year we are now, currently now, piloting a course uh, online which is uh, based on peer learning and the first cohort was uh, 103 uh, healthcare providers from 47 countries from all over the world, we plan to expand this to other languages and more participants. And with this, I finalize saying many thanks again for this opportunity to share this information with you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, very much for the detailed description of activities covering COVID, preventable harm, asymptomatic health assessment, radiation safety culture, risk communication, and all those things. Uh, we have uh, good questions coming for COVID uh, because of the topical interest in this area. And uh, let me start with the first, first question that if a patient dies uh, after administration of radioactive iodine, high doses, and is COVID pos positive, what is the criteria for disposal, the dose limits for staff? So I think Ola can talk about the dose limit for staff, which of course does not change, and also for public, uh, but he can confirm that. And then uh, Maria can talk about further uh, aspects of dealing with the COVID cases as far as radiation protection is concerned. Ola, unmute, unmute please. Please unmute. Ola, you have to unmute. Ola, you are muted. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I was, uh, it was uh, not possible for me to unmute in, uh, in okay. this program. So you will have to repeat what you said. Okay. No, uh, I didn't. I, I, just, I just said that I can't unmute. Oh, I see. Okay. So um, if I understood it correctly, it was about the first question about yeah. um, uh, high dose radio iodine therapy and what happens. Uh, okay. Well, that's a very it's a very complex question. This uh, actually, I think you have to split it up in some way between um, the radiation protection aspects and the COVID uh, aspects, of course. And um, uh, I can, in in fairness, only speak to the uh, radiation protection aspects. Uh, I think it's what we have to remember here is that. Um, uh, uh, dose limits are according to the national regulations that you have. Uh, when it comes to um, the um, uh, disposal of the dead body, um, it's, uh, you may have some national regulations in relation to this also. There is some IAEA guidance on this issue uh, in a safety report on um, the uh, release of patients uh, after radionuclide treatment. Um, so I think there's, there is a little bit of guidance in this, but you have to, to turn to your national regulations for the radiation protection aspects. When it comes to the, the COVID aspects, then it becomes complex, of course. I mean, I understand that. Uh, in terms of radiation protection of patients, which I'm working with here, we have mainly looked at um, COVID and patient protection uh, in terms of, for example, um, radiation protection and chest imaging in COVID-19. And we have not really looked at how, it, how COVID affects uh, the um, uh, occupational radiation protection in uh, the handling of dead bodies, etc. So it's difficult for me to respond to that. I don't know if um, anyone else has some, some uh, thing to add. 
Thank you, Ola, and rightly so. It's a difficult situation which uh, is being faced and new que questions emerging. But as far as radiation protection is concerned, it remains the same, whatever the uh, guidelines mm. for those limits are for the staff and for the uh, public. So the, they remain same. And I don't see that there is any need to change them. And I'll now pass on to Maria to talk about the other aspects of handling of COVID because WHO has done a good job of a good deal of job in the last few months on this issue. Maria, please. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, managing infection prevention and control for COVID uh, has some things that are similar to uh, radiation protection in the way that uh, the, the distance, the time, <laughs> and the protection with barriers are the tools that you have to protect. But with COVID it's much easier because you can uh, protect uh, even if it's a dead body, but you use the same approaches. You use isolation of the body and uh, the protection of the health workers with all the barriers that you normally uh, will provide the PPE, what we call the PPE for infection prevention and control and uh, the, the dead bodies are uh, completely isolated and manipulated in this kind of isolation and uh, the virus will not go out as it could be the case for gamma radiation in, in, in iodine. For, on the other side, iodine has an advantage that has a very short time, uh, half life, so in a few days it will also be a, a decrease, but there should be definitely uh, the, the um, indicating the, the, um, the values that are recommended for the radiation uh, exposure. For COVID, you will apply the same approaches that you use for infection prevention and control with a, 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 a living person, and that even with less problems with uh, the possible trans transmission with the secretions, etc. So, uh, I mean, I think it's a combination of the two protocols and it's not the contradiction here. Thank you, Maria. Uh, another question on COVID is the HRCT. Again, it comes to you. Uh, uh, although the questioner is mentioning multiple HRCTs, but I think uh, uh, there is uh, no need for multiple uh, HRCTs and HRCT gives much lesser radiation dose. Uh, in my hospital, it is for average, we have 4.88. So the, I, there is a lot of misuse of that. And I will ask Maria about the guidance from WHO, which you have developed on that. Well, uh, if you want to know the guidance for WHO, I recommend you to go to the rapid advice guys, rapid advice guide. You will see here very specific scenarios for patients with um, suspicion, suspected or confirmed COVID. And there is um, definitely WHO does not recommend the use of a CT or even imaging for, for a screening in asymptomatic uh, people. And in the case of uh, symptomatic people where it is a clinical indication, yes, but you will see in the recommendations that uh, chest radiography also has a, a place in uh, in the, uh, in the early detection of COVID. Uh, has also a role during hospitalization for uh, making a decision on whether putting a patient in a regular ward or in ICU. But it, it was uh, recommended that it, the evidence shows that it does not have a role for making a decision on patient discharge. In, thus, in that case, the priority uh, is, um, the, pre the prevalence is, the use of uh, clinical parameters because the uh, radiological resolution comes much later than the clinical resolution and the negative, of course, the negative test. And nowadays we are working on the use of chest imaging after patient discharge. The new uh, second edition includes one recommendation on that. It is not proved that it is necessary to, um, to systematically pre perform imaging in those patients. And uh, imaging will be applied in, uh, based on a clinical indication, but not systematically for every patient who, who has been discharged uh, on a regular basis. But I suggest you read in the, the specific scenarios there. 
Thank you. But uh, does WHO have some idea about the variation in the practice in different parts of the world? Because in some countries it is really being uh, overused. Yes, it has been uh, a survey has been conducted in collaboration with ISR, and it has been included in uh, as a as part of information for the guideline. And it has ISR published the survey, so you can see there uh, the current practice. And it's true, yeah, in many in many countries is being overused. This is why we have been focusing really very much the work on recommending when to use, but also you will see recommendations on when not to use, when imaging is not recommended. This is important, yeah. I totally agree with you, madam. Thank you. Uh, there is a question on the radiation safety culture. Should there be a course in the university for health physics uh, profession, uh, students? Madam, I think Ola wants to say something, but she cannot open the microphone. I would like to hear it, Ma Ola. Uh, try now, Ola. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think it's because I, I'm not the host anymore, so it's, it's not okay. working. Magdalena, can you change, please? Ah. Okay. I I just wanted to um, to add to the uh, excellent comments uh, by Maria there that um, uh, the um, IAEA has also published uh, some scientific papers on COVID-19 imaging and the surveys of what's, how it's uh, done in practice uh, at the moment. So these are available for free also. You can... Uh, find them through um, Googling or PubMed uh, and, and find some of the uh, uh, what was found in surveys in different hospitals around the world on the practice of COVID-19 imaging. Uh, and it's, it's all available for free. Um, there's some type of um, provision of free articles on COVID-19 that's going on that you can, uh, you can look at that. Thank you. Thank you. So back to that question on uh, radiation safety culture course in the university, uh, maybe Maria? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's, I think it's for both organizations, <laughs> that question. But if, if I will answer very quickly, because if it is about education on radiation protection, uh, radiation safety culture, I really would like to, to give the floor to IAA because uh, our colleague, um, Debbie Gilly, who is also a member of this group uh, with uh, IRPA, OMP and WHO uh, developing the guide on radiation safety culture, uh, IAA has developed an excellent, excellent tool for education and training. The answer is yes. Safety culture should be trained and it's a different training is not training in radiation safety. This is definitely also necessary, but there should be a train on safety culture, on the 10 traits of safety culture and how to build them and how to embed them in the daily work. And uh, I really, I, I, I hope you all can also join me on this because uh, you and IAA have developed an excellent tool to complement we are complementing each other, definitely, on this. So I think your tool is yes. excellent. Yeah, I think this is a, a, typically a, a topic that um, the IAA and the WHO has uh, collaborated on uh, for a, a long time now. And um, we, we have um, this hybrid material that I, it was actually in the presentation, but I think, unfortunately, it seemed to have skipped the, that slide, uh, if I saw correctly. We have some new hybrid training material on radiation safety culture in healthcare that is available. It was launched earlier this year. And when I say hybrid, it, it's because it's intended for in-person training, but it's um, complemented by a number of digital presentations from different medical facilities around the world where they actually are hands-on showing how to improve safety culture in practice. Mm -hmm. So I would urge you to, to have a look at this. This is um, uh, some material that can be used for really training radiation safety culture in healthcare. So 
I think it's it's quite unique in that sense, and it's it's been good to uh, collaborate on with uh, WHO on these different safety culture uh, aspects uh, in in the medical world. And if I may add something, uh, Madame, I yeah. think uh, all all the stakeholders have a role, but medical physicists, I think you all you have a special role in education and training in safety culture. So we really use, I would like to use this uh, opportunity of having hundreds of people from all over the world to invite you to, to commit to enhance radiation safety culture in your, in your hospitals, in your settings. Uh, it's very nice, the training in the document that will be published soon also, we put 18 case studies that were provided by many of you also. So thank you for, to, to those who contributed. So the idea is to have a really an interactive um, implementation process in the coming years and to give, bring this to the, the implementation toolkit that uh, will be also for the one call for action. So I think it's, um, we, have to, we have to keep this momentum and medical physicists have a key role. Uh, thank you, Maria. I think the, uh, the, the, I don't know if you had shown the slide of the document which WHO is bringing because the question I see the just coming, what is the name of the last publication about radiation safety health, uh, uh, culture in healthcare? So, uh, which is uh, about to be released. Uh, enhancing, yeah, it's enhancing radiation safety culture in healthcare and it's a guidance for healthcare providers but the, the name is enhancing radiation safety culture in healthcare and you will see there tools indicators the framework etc yeah. and we hope we will de develop together uh, further derivative uh, products so that uh, publication is uh, coming from WHO, but it is a joint publication with it's a IUMP, joint. Yeah, uh, with IAA, IUMP, and uh, IRPA. So, IRPA and WHO. Yeah. So and then um, uh, you have heard about the uh, huge training material which is. Uh, prepared by the IAEA. So best is to put in the Google radiation safety culture, IAEA, patient protection and radiation safety culture, WHO. So one will be able to reach the right spot. Um, the IAEA material is already available and this yes. uh, publication is uh, on the way. And uh, yes. coming back to the question of uh, in the curriculum, uh, um, uh, in principles, yes, it should be there. Uh, in the universities. So, uh, but uh, number and all, I don't think we have debated on that, how much uh, number of hours and all that. We, we, we have not debated on that. Okay, the next question is on postmortem of the patients uh, with COVID-19 and uh, with radiation uh, burden in that. Postmortem, I think, did we not discuss that? <laughs> I doubt if we said the same, uh, the same uh, scenario, no? Like, um, mm. I think it's a similar scenario. That's the first question. Yeah. You should use the, the PPE for, for staff and the protection for the patient for COVID and uh, the same procedures for if it is iodine, if it is a, a long time uh, with different half life. Of course, it depends. If it is nuclear medicine and the radionuclide has a longer half-life, probably the, the measures will be dif different. But at the end, it will be always based on the uh, on the the reference values or, or limits for the public, etc. So it's yeah. a similar scenario. Yeah, the main thing is that uh, the radiation in the patient should not become an obstacle in postmortem. Right, uh, there, uh, it, there is no requirement that uh, postmortem cannot be conducted because patient is radioactive. Is that correct? Uh, I, I don't know who wants to answer that question. No, that it depends on the level of the internal contamination. In normal situations, not. In emergency situations, uh, yes, a postmortem 
individual may have a level of radioactivity that may oblige you to put even a shield in eh? it, but this is really in an emergency situation. You need to call a radiation protection officer to, to assess their dose rate at different distances, but it's the same protocols that you apply uh, uh, with a patient that has no COVID, with the only difference that in addition to that, you will use the personal protective equipment that you use for infection prevention and control, and you will protect the body with the typical bats, et cetera, that we see in all the hospitals, unfortunately. Unfortunately, very often now. Oh, thank you. Uh, Maria, I, I heard you say that now your WHO is developing a guidance on after the patient is discharged, uh, the COVID patient. So that, uh, I think that is a, a situation which we see more and more. And uh, what are the questions you are handling in that document? The recommendation in the in the second edition that I hope you will see it in May uh, is basically is that WHO does not recommend systematically schedule uh, imaging procedures in every patient who is discharged. And then there are specific remarks for particular conditions, like patients who developed signs of uh, potential fibrosis or uh, interstitial infiltrations, or that continue with clinical symptoms that will justify to perform an imaging procedure. But the, the main reason why WHO provided this recommendation because is because, as you said, Madame, in many countries, patients were being systematically scheduled to have even CTs, in some cases, chest X-rays, or in some cases, CTs, systematically. And, um, and this is really uh, the evidence. We conducted systematic reviews, and the last one was in October, and now a new one that finished this last week. Uh, there is no evidence that this will uh, be justified. Um, so uh, the, the indication will be based on clinical signs or symptoms, but not systematically for a follow-up. Follow-up, you have a functional, there is a specific protocol for follow-up, functional tests um, and clinical examinations, but not systematically imaging. Thank you. Uh, I think we have dealt with uh, most of the questions which pertain to today's talk. There are some others which are basic in nature and ozone layer and all those kinds of things which are outside the scope of today's presentation. And uh, with that, I think I, uh, unless uh, uh, both, uh, both speakers have something to say, otherwise we go to wind up. Any uh, remark, uh, Maria and Ola, you have? No, oh, thank you for the invitation. Oh, nice to meet you all. Yeah. Thank you. So let me then announce the, about the next webinars. Hmm. So tomorrow, Thursday, is the webinar on does contact shielding improve the patient safety? So I urge you all to join. And then on mm -hmm. Friday, the webinar is on management of unintended and accidental exposures. So these are the two. And we have also for the next month already on the website, you can see for the month of May, we have the web two webinars announced. So I urge you to look at the website uh, and uh, uh, register uh, there. So with that, I wish to thank uh, very sincerely both the speakers, uh, Dr. Ola Homburg and Dr. Maria Preis for their wonderful presentations and for answering questions, which interest, very interesting questions which uh, were raised. And I want to thank uh, uh, Maria, uh, Magdalena Stova, who has been the person behind the scene handling all the technical matters and finally thanks to all the participants for their presentation for their active participation 
with that uh, thank you very much and look forward to seeing you in the coming webinars thank you have a wonderful thank day. you thank you to everybody eh thank you bye bye